Right, we're here at Abalimi Bezikaya doing a bit of a fact-finding mission for our own garden in Crossroads. This area is called Fezeka. They're doing some excellent work in all over the place. You see right outside the door, you see some lovely trees and play equipment and stuff mm. like that. That's all new and if you drive through the townships, you'll see now finally there are whole lots and lots and lots of trees which are surviving because they've learned to protect them so they get higher and it's actually working. Yeah? Um, lots of stuff actually does work. You can set that next to all the huge corruption and inefficiency and money grubbing that is going on. Yeah? And sort of complete, <laughs> it's my turn to eat mindset. Yeah? Um, which is almost a necessity in, in, uh, when you think of where we come from. You know? So we have to go through that my turn to eat mindset in the world. Everyone has to have their turn to eat. You know? If they don't get their turn to eat, they feel badly done by. You know? And if you feel you're not going to get your turn to eat, you've got to steal in order to get your turn to eat. That's what you're going to do. You know? I'm not justifying it, but that's the mindset. You know? and so, but um, we've got a situation where there's a lot that the government could be proud of and could speak about more clearly so that people don't completely have no confidence in government. You know? It's not like everything's bad. You know? So, I mean, um, just go back to the community court. There's a wonderful magistrate there. He's a smart guy and he has initiated this this uh, deployment program so that these community service people can come work in the garden yeah and they ha are turning out to be a great help to the ladies who run the garden yeah? and slowly but surely there's even a couple of them who are starting to think now nah, actually maybe I'd like to become a gardener or a farmer yeah? then stuff can start to happen you know and all because of an, a, a good official yeah? who had a good idea and there's there's other good officials who, who do their jobs properly. They don't just sit around, you know, drawing their salaries for nothing. They actually, you know, that, it happens. Yeah? So it really does, there is stuff that works. And I think we can be proud of that. Just to juxtapose something just for you, I've just done a trip right around the country looking at all the rural areas where I used to work for Operation Hunger back in the oh. 70s and 80s. I used to, I set up the agriculture program for Operation Hunger back then. And I traveled countrywide into all the deep rural areas. And back then there wasn't a brick house to be seen except in rare occasions. Just millions of people settled on distant land without service. Now you go everywhere and there's brick houses. Everywhere. You almost look anywhere in this brick houses. As far as you can see. Plus very often, not by no means always, services. Maybe services that don't work properly, but they're there. You know? Plus, you see lots of little mini palaces everywhere. Huh? And lots of people working to build these mini palaces. Rob, Rob, are we talking about the Western Cape or the Eastern Cape? I'm talking about countrywide, throughout the whole rural areas. I've just traveled down a whole country trip. And, um, Wherever you go, except in some you know, exceptional areas, there is, it's, it's like chalk and cheese. 20 years ago to now, it's like looking at a completely different country. So there has been massive progress, but that's not reported. However, black people know that. They know there's been massive progress. They feel it in every possible way. Not enough, but huge steps. That's why the ANC gets the vote. You go everywhere and you see this massive progress from the ground up, yeah? um, which wasn't there 20 years ago. And those mini palaces that are all being built, probably some of them, I don't know where this guy wants to come through. some of those, because you, you look in these rural areas, so there's all the RDP houses, yeah? Hundreds, tens of hundreds of thousands, where there used to be only mud huts, yeah? And then in between the RDP houses, you see these palaces, these mini palaces, mini in Kanda, 
It's everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> and lots of people working on them. Huh? Where do you think that money comes yeah. from? Yeah. So now, all that corruption that's that? happening, oh, call it, yeah, the upside of that is that South Africans, particularly black South Africans, don't go put their money in banks. They bring it back and they build houses, invest in cows, invest in their land, pay people to help them. So countrywide, there's a lot of people working. And I'm not saying it's all because of corruption, but I've met lots of good, upright, honest citizens who are investing their pensions and, and doing it legitimately. Yeah? So that's, that's my direct observation. And I say that South Africa rocks. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah? And the, 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 the pure bad picture we get in the paper is true, but it's one side. Huh? It's one side. It doesn't look at the whole thing. So, it's going to just counter. I'm not saying that it's all corruption money by any means, but definitely you can bet that most people who are corrupt won't be investing in Swiss bank accounts or in derivatives. Huh? <laughs> all that money going, you know, going back to people's homes, homesteads, families, concrete investments. Huh? which then create jobs, which is causing massive spin-off in this country. And wherever you look, there's shopping centers. You can't believe it. This is now supposed to be poor South Africa. Massive shopping centers are being built in the most ridiculously rural places. Uh, I couldn't believe my eyes in Hazy. Hazy. Yeah. Up in um, Limpopo. A uh, 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 backwater paradise. Yeah. But of huge poverty. You can't believe the shopping and around it is the sea of not rich people. But it's something. It's amazing. So what's happening there? Tell me that South Africa is failing. It's the same with Zimbabwe. Everyone said well, Zimbabwe is going to die. It didn't die. Not by any means. The only people who died were people that Mugabe didn't like. Huh? They were deprived of sea, land, water. Huh? That is it. Yeah. But anyone else who stayed out of Mugabe's bad books made a plan. And wherever you went in Zimbabwe, even in the worst time, there was abundant food. Abundant food everywhere, in every corner. Food coming out of people's ears. They didn't starve. They planted food. They knew how to do it. So, I'm just presenting another side to the African picture. Which, which Africans know, black Africans know very well. And they're positive. Most black Africans are very, very positive about South Africa. Extremely positive. Feeling, hey, things are cooking. We've got a chance. Yeah? And it's the, the negative is sitting with the, intele in, in the intellectuals, and, the, and they're not just white, but it's sitting with the intellectuals and the people who are afraid to lose their piles. Huh? which are invested in derivatives. So that's where the fear comes from. So I'm just giving that as a background, and all starting from this little success story here, and um, then come and see another success story. Mediterranean climate. You can grow all year round anywhere on this planet, even in permafrost if you've got the gear. But um, it gets more expensive as it gets colder and more permafrost. Okay. At any rate, it's possible to grow all year round anywhere, but Mediterranean is the easiest. It gives you the most options. The only times it's very difficult to grow something new is in the deepest summer, which is December, January, and then July. Late June, July, when the rains are pouring down, but also when the days are dark, just a few hours of daylight. And in summer is our worst time, because then we get 40 degrees heat on a regular basis combined with gale force berg winds which are hot and a whole crop, a whole field can just shrivel like that. If, if the watering is not like geared they lose whole crops and they often do. Yeah? So, and it all just goes to seed. 
Um, so those are our worst time. Our worst time is summer. It's, it's like deep winter in Europe or America. You could say it's comparable. It is, it is punishing. Totally punishing. Um, but it's brilliant if you apply some nous, some skills, and some discipline. Yeah? Um, so you can actually manage it. And you, got, you ladies, you know you are gardeners and you, oh, you garden in Gale Force Wind on a regular basis. You know that anything's possible with, with just the, the right knowledge and attitude. We are lucky as far as water is concerned in Cape Town. We have right under your feet a huge water tank that stretches for hundred kilo, hundreds of kilometers in all directions. Well, this place, Cape Town, was known as the place of running waters by the Bushmen. And it is the place of running waters. If 19th century mentality doesn't continue covering with tarmac and blocking up the strings, springs, yeah, which is 19th century mentality, and uh, which then goes to build dams, instead of using the resource and treasuring the resource that's under its own feet. So, the idea with 19th century thinking is the water under our feet is bound to be dirty because people are living their lives. That's simply not true. We test our water every six months. It's spotless, perfect for human consumption and for crop irrigation. Even though people might be living within a few kilometers who are polluting their lens. Huh? Because we have a filter system under the ground that filters out all the baddies. So if you remember recently there was a big scare because of um, there was a farmer who was using polluted water from the Lotus River. It caused such a brohaha, it was unbelievable. That actually that was very localized, it was impossible to spread unless people use Lotus Water River everywhere. And that Lotus Water River that's polluted is only polluted in that section. So you know it's just one has to actually apply one's mind here <laughs> properly before reacting yeah. as well. But on the other hand, one has to know one's cookies. Yeah. So underneath this ground is a beautiful water table. There's rivers everywhere. Wherever you put down a borehole on the Cape Flats, for hundreds of square kilometers, there's water. Sometimes it can be brackish, in which case you're out of luck. It can be badly brackish. That means it's, there's a trap, there's a, there's a lens that's, that's somehow been sealed off from the hole and there's no refreshment taking place and just get completely break. Um, otherwise it's wonderful, so water is abundant and as long as it rains, please God, we're okay. Yeah? Um, then the other thing, well just to point out, those tanks get filled up from the borehole which is in that concrete circle. The concrete, uh, borehole is down there is pumped into the tanks and from the tanks through a pressure pump into the water system which you hear chick chicking in the background. What you're looking at is a fully established um, late subsistence level market, would be market garden but it's a, a community garden which is aiming to become a market garden um, and it's only in the last years since 2008 that we've managed to convert the mindset from planting seasonally to planting continuously. That was a huge leap. Before that you'd come at Christmas time and there were no gardens to show, it was all just desert. And people would plant again in February. Yeah? Um, so uh, that, that sort of, what's it, uh, seasonal agriculture mind is deeply embedded in, in our psyche and to shift that was quite an achievement and we were only able to finally shift it in 2008 when we launched a marketing scheme and that I'm going to show you later. Um, this garden is one out of about a few hundred out there, most of whom that we have had an intervention with, my wife I believe has had an intervention with of which at any one time we're working with between 70 to 100. So this is one out of around 100 gardens that we are working with at any one time. 
There's 17 staff members in Abilene. Most of them are black female farmers who have become trainers. So that's 12 people plus a couple of male assistants. And they run the show. The rest are professional support personnel. So you'll meet the mamas who run the show in the pack shed just now. I am spokesperson, ex-CEO, now co-director, together with Mama Kaba and the financial guy, Roland Welter, a German. And Mama Kaba is the leader of the farming movement. And she, her word is like God's word, you know, when she chooses to exercise it. She's very humble. <coughs> so she's out there, and she's, you'll see her at the pack shed, and I'm now more just the spokesperson. So we have converted. We're no longer white-led. That's still a perception out there. Now we're black-led, black-run by black peasants, not educated people, supported by a small group of more educated people. Yeah? So our target group is running Abilene, the farmers themselves, like these mamas here who are at best they've got to stand at eight or matric. Yeah? Um, and what you're looking at then is an ecological oasis. In those bushes, in those hedgerows, you'll find sunbirds, chameleons and all sorts of fauna, all of whom munch and crunch all the baddies and, mo and th that's our pest control combined with building soil building. Other than that, we've got a pest called the ca white cabbage butterfly. You can see her flying around there and she has to be literally squashed. All her um, worms, all her little um, the hatchlings have to be squashed on the leaf or taken off mm -hmm. by hand regularly or uh, and otherwise they try spraying chili pepper mixed with um, water and, and a bit of salt and that, that also helps to control it huh? and soap. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, natural oasis like a mini Kirsten bush which is growing abundant food. That's what we're aiming at. Lots and lots and lots of mini Kirsten bushes growing abundant food. Okay? Um, and then creating jobs. So here's the job. This is plot number one, 20 square meters, spring onion planting week, the 7th of the 2nd, 2013, 16 per square meter. This is a contract with these ladies. You saw in the, they're taking a rest because they were harvesting this morning and the harvest is already collected, I think. This was left over, which they're going to use themselves. You'll see the harvest back the pack shed. And we, we, I believe me, come to them and we say, guys, would you like to make some money? And they say, yeah, okay. Yeah, and then um, uh, if you plant these onions for us and treat them in a certain way, and if they're all of the best quality, we'll buy the lot from you at the best price that you can get. Okay? Better than what you can get from any other vendor or buyer. So, and they agree. So they're guaranteed market. It's one of our keys. We buy everything. The stuff that's not up to standard, they have to eat or consume, and that's usually around 25%, sometimes up to 50%. 25% is normal for all agriculture crops. 50% is a little bit too much, uh, but we don't mind as long as it's consumed. Unfortunately, a lot is not consumed and goes into the compost. So a lot of seconds are going to the compost because there's too much trouble to find a home for them. Okay. And so there's a huge possibility for uh, processing seconds. Dried spinach. I was in the rural areas, the old technologies, pumpkins, spinach, where you take greens and you dry it, you cook it slightly and you dry it in the sun on a platter. Okay. And you come out with this lovely hard dried ball, which is fantastic survival food. You can stash it under the bed for months. And when you need it again, you just cook it up slightly, mix it with some pup, and it's brilliant. Best quality food on the planet. What's your spinach? Any green spinach. Uh, a lot of the people use pumpkin leaves. So there's indigenous technologies there. Food security is not an issue, guys. It's, it's, it's mindset that's the issue. 
simple and pure. And then it's about money. So when you say the gardens don't work, when you've tried to help people grow, the reason is people are completely focused on the consumer economy, only want jobs and houses, yeah, and don't see gardening as progressive. It's something you do until something better happens. Yeah? Okay, so that's the reality in the world, not just in South Africa. And particularly in South Africa, it's noticeable. So when you get educated, you're too clever to garden. Yeah? It's only the uneducated people that garden, or the super smart farmer with the big tractor. Everything in between is a is a either a wealthy lady's you know thing they can afford to garden, or it's something which old people do to make them happy. Yeah? Or it's yeah what we used to do. Yeah? And it's, it's, we leave that behind. We're going you know, forward now. You know? That's currently still the case, generally. So to shift that is what we're about. You know? and when I see young men like this who might think, ah, oh, he's actually right, or hey, maybe it's cool to work in the garden, get involved, um, then there's hope. And there's, there are those young people coming in now. We've got a few of them. You might, you'll meet one later, maybe. Polisa. Brilliant. Just, it's like, I call it the new way. There's men and young people who have awoken. And they say, hang on a second, but all of those old ways are actually cool. They're smart. They're not stupid. It's not just for stupids who don't have jobs. Yeah? It's for smart people who have jobs. <laughs> who have education. It's healthy. It's good. Yeah? So, that's the, so there is hope. Real hope there. So then, that's a contract. On 500 square meters of ground like this, we create one job valued at between 500 rand a month to 3,000 rand a month after costs. On 100 square meters, we can grow enough food to feed a whole family of five or six year round with all the fresh food they can ever dream of having, plus, plus, plus. That's not a problem. Food security is not a problem. It's a mental problem. It's really simply that. Um, so the, the food security that has to then happen in relation to career prospects. When, you, when we have some people making real money, the smart young dudes like these guys looking all cool with the dark glasses, <laughs> checking out, <laughs> hey man, digging in the garden, putting the money in their pockets, <laughs> and everything's cool and wonderful, and then, they, and because they, may, they kind of perceive to have made it, yeah? Then others say, hey, now that's cool too, you yeah? and, know? And, well, it helps, put it that way, yeah? To have icons, mm. yeah? And particularly black icons. Who really, really believe it, really live it, live the life. We're building icons now. That's our next phase, is identifying icons. The older people are cool. They're the ones who built the movement. Most of the gardens are populated by older women, with men coming in for the money and younger people coming in for the potential careers um, but until there's some serious icons who people can relate to who are really cooking so a mama has bought her car because of her cabbages huh? yeah? that stuff is going to start to happen soon yeah? on 500 square meters not on big land yeah? 500 square meters is this size here before in front of the hedge yeah? that's one job we don't need big land to feed the nation. That's a Monsanto, the part of agriculture myth. You, 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 we, we can feed this whole city on 3,000 hectares with all the fresh vegetables they ever need. Already we're feeding half the city in Philippi horticulture area down the road on half the land. 50% of the vegetables of Cape Town are grown already on 1,500 square meters, uh, hectares, sorry. Yeah? So, it's, that's just vegetables. And there's crops, there's different ways of growing proteins. Sweet potatoes um, uh, and, and um, carbohydrates, which don't require huge space. Convert to sorghum again. Yeah? Um, it's the best crop on the planet. Makes the fantastic beer, which leaves you with no hangover. Um, um, but, yeah? um, you drink it, you have a marvelous time, and the next day there's no hangover. Huh? Fantastic. 
same with the marula beer that is made. Why aren't we going commercial with this stuff? I don't know. Yeah? Why not? Yeah? It's a, it's a business opportunity waiting to happen. And we don't need the big land. And that's the message I just want to get through to everybody. We don't need big farms to feed the world. We can feed 10 billion people on this planet easily on a fraction of the land that we have. And the rest has to be used for industry, uh, which is already the case. Did you know that 15% of the world's edible food is produced in little backyard plots in cities with minimal support from government for tax dollars? 15%. That's without any real support. And now there's this nonsense that we have to have big farms to feed the world. So there we are. So here you've got the basis of food security, job security for thousands plus health security plus uh, nature conservation renewal. Everything all in one. So you can take a little walk, take a look, and we'll go to the pack shed. I'm here to answer questions. And if you want to pop in and say hello to the mamas, they're there, they love to chat, so just go in and have a chat. Take you up in paradise up above If you would tell me I'm the only one that you love Life could be a dream, sweetheart Hello, hello again Shaboom and hope we'll meet again Oh, life could be a dream If only all my precious plans would come true If you would let me spend my whole life loving you Life could be a dream, sweetheart Look at you, something is on my mind. If you do what I want you to, baby, we'd be so fine. Oh, life could be a dream. If I could take you up in paradise up above. If you would tell me I'm the only one that you love. Life could be a dream, sweetheart.